The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Triversity Talk. I am Stephen Bloomer Teague. And I am Wendy Stewart Kaplan. And it's great to have you all here with us on Sunday night. You could be doing anything, but they're here with us. And I and I am just thrilled. I mean, yes, uh, dinners and cocktails, and yet you're here watching our little program, and we are so grateful. Um, and thank you for watching and if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, um, definitely feel free to give us a subscribe or a like. That will help us reach out to even more people. So we'd be extremely grateful for that. Tell your friends about us. Tell your friends about <laughs> us. I mean, we're fantastic. So we, we are. Th they need to know. We they pat need to know. On the back. Um, so also, we'd love to have your questions tonight. Um, so as we um, begin our conversation with Elizabeth. Um, just throw those questions. If we can pepper them throughout, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll just save some time at the end and start throwing out those questions to Elizabeth at the end of the show. We really have, it's such a hot show tonight. We have Elizabeth Geitz, author of Spirituality, Spiritual Talk in the Age of Fake News. Now, Almost spiritual truth in the age of fake news. But you, I mean, you were right You know on me, the I, I, always, I always make mistakes like that. But <laughs> this is such a controversial thing because fake news came along and undermined everything. And one of the things I, I said to Elizabeth, how does this relate to our LGBTQ community? And she's going to talk about the Bible and homosexuality, which is really something a lot of us don't know anything about. So get ready with your questions. We're going to be on fire tonight. All right. And with that, let's introduce our special guest for tonight. Um, welcome, Elizabeth Geitz. Thank you. Hi. I am delighted to be here. And uh, I hope some of my friends are skipping their dinner and cocktail hour. <laughs> dynamic duo of uh, Wendy and Steven. So yeah. well, thanks I for inviting me. Absolutely. I mean, it's great to have a fellow Gamecock on here. That was an <laughs> exciting surprise when you told me you went to the real USC, which as yes. you should know, is the University of South Carolina. We came first. I didn't know that was... I knew that you both went to, but I didn't know USC was. Yes. Oh, the, my God. Yeah, so. USC, that was the first USC. Indeed. Yeah. So it's like a reunion for the two of you. Well, I mean, we didn't we didn't graduate together, but uh, so. uh, no, we we missed each other just a few years, right? So, <laughs> a teeny tiny bit. Well, thank you so much for for being here tonight. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So I think I. What would you like to open up with? Because I have so many questions. I, I, well, I mean, Elizabeth. I mean, let's start by talking about you before we dive yeah. into. Um, right you know, um, spiritual truth in the age of fake news. What kind of led you to this path of writing such a book, you know, and being involved in the church and then, yeah. Uh, well, I'm an Episcopal priest and I am actually retired now. And um, what led me to write this book are the times in which we are living. I wrote it in pre-COVID times. It was more the... Um, polarization that exists in our country right now on a lot of different issues. And I believe that all of us are called to use whatever knowledge we have, whatever gifts we have, whatever skills we have to, to help that dialogue along by putting some real news, true news out there that people can um, 
chew on a little bit and maybe counter some of the fake news that's been around actually for centuries. Fake news is not new. Right. You, uh, you've said that it's connected. The, the Bible spoke of things that were fake news, that it was just put out there as a way for people really to validate and define themselves. Well, I, I, I think what I, the way I would word put that is mm -hmm. that some of the way the Bible has been interpreted for centuries and centuries perpetuates fake news. It perpetuates the fake news that some people are here and some people are here. Mm -hmm. Some people are better than others simply because of how they were born. And uh, that is not what the Bible really says. And that's what I wrote the book for, is to set the record straight on that. So with you setting the record straight, I, it makes me wonder, um, did you make yourself a target in the religious community by doing that? Because surely a lot of what you had to say was not well received. Um, I, well, and within the Episcopal Church, uh, I am not a target, um, but certainly in mainstream Christianity, uh, yes, because the religious right has been, uh, they've sort of uh, kidnapped the word Christian and spoken for many of us who do not share those points of view. And I'm sure I would be a target for um, some people, sure. Now, Elizabeth, you um, you did not grow up Episcopal, right? You grew up kind of like me in a Southern um, tradition. <laughs> I, I grew up Southern Baptist, but um, what was your tradition when you grew up? Well, um, my grandparents were Southern Baptist. I grew up in the Bible Belt, just like you did in Tennessee. And uh, my grandmother did a lot of my religious upbringing. I went to church with her and was terrified by these revivals and, you know, you're going to hell kind of sermons. And um, then uh, I became a Methodist because my, well, my parents were Methodists. So I was brought up in the Methodist church and became Episcopalian because I married one. You know, when I went to the ordination committees, they said, oh, well, what kind of theology brought you to our church? I said, well, none, you know, it, it had nothing to do with that. I my good little Southern self and I married an Episcopalian, so I became one. So not a very uh, illuminating answer, but it was the truth. But it's incredible yeah, that really. your, your path led you to be in at least, I, a denomination, I would say, that allows you to express these viewpoints without being openly condemned by the church at large or your denomination at large. Well, I would say the Episcopal Church, like all mainline denominations, has grown in the area of LGBTQ uh, issues, just as it's grown in the area of women's ordination issues. Uh, the first book that I wrote was on that, and um, I was a target within my own church, and I figured I'd never get a job if I wrote the book. And you know, it 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 you 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 can be a target within your own church, but but my my plan all along was to say, okay, rather than saying uh, institutional religion is bankrupt and forget the whole thing, I said I'm going to get inside of it and see if I can work to change it from the inside. And that's what a number of my books have tried to do. This one very much so on a lot of different issues, certainly the uh, LGBTQ issues as well. You're really putting yourself out there when you, when you do that kind of thing. How did you end up on such a spiritual path? Well, um, <laughs> I never, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of an interesting story. I never, thought I would work outside the home. I was a stay at home housewife and lived in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, our daughter was in kindergarten at a Sacred Heart School and they started an outreach ministry in Trenton, New Jersey. And they started advertising for people to come down there and work in a preschool. And I, I didn't want to go down there. I was scared. I mean, this, this was in the eighties and I, didn't know what might happen to me, but something kept nagging at me. This voice in my head kept saying, uh -huh. you need to go down there. You need, and they kept sending these announcements out, you know, and things she brought home from school and I'd throw them out. Then another announcement would come and I'd throw it out. 
Well, long story short, I called down there and I said, uh, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not going to do this. I just have some questions. <laughs> and, um, I'm asking for somebody else. A friend. Yeah. Right. And uh, a friend. the Catholic nun answers the phone and she goes, oh, you're the answer to my prayers. I've been praying for somebody like you. You used to teach English and I need your help. And I said, I can't be the answer to your prayers. I promise you, I am not coming down there. Well, if you've ever met a Catholic nun, you really don't stand a chance against them. <laughs> I ended up working in inner city Trenton and starting a GED program for women on welfare. And it turned my life completely upside down. And for the first time, racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism were staring me right in the face. And I had to ask myself some really hard questions and look in the mirror and say, okay, what's going on here? There's something not right about this world that we live in. And so what are you gonna do about it? What was your moment of truth? That, that was it. I'll tell you, I, they asked me to make, okay, I have done something live before. I just told you all I'd never done live. <laughs> they, they asked me to make a video with a Haitian immigrant who had come to Trenton and we were, you know, sitting there looking at each other. And um, I lived a very comfortable life in Princeton, New Jersey. He lived a very uncomfortable life as a Haitian immigrant in inner city Trenton. And I felt like the eyes of God were looking at me. Wow. And that was a moment of reckoning for me. And I said, okay, uh, uh, God's given me certain gifts. What am I going to do with them? What am I going to do? And I decided that the best thing I could do at that point uh, was to go to seminary and get ordained and then preach, teach, write, do the kind of things I'm trying to do in spiritual truth in the age of fake news. So with that said, why don't we dive into spiritual truth in the age of fake yeah. news? I mean, as you mentioned, when you were confronted with racism, classism, heterosexism, sexism, and I mean, this is what your book dives into, it are all of these different topics. And, um, and of course, the one we're going to focus on tonight is heterosexism. I mean, I read this chapter of the book and it was so funny because I was like, some of the bad verses were the ones that were leveled at me when I first came out of the closet. And the first, really? I mean, the first of that being, I told a friend and I got Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> so, uh, so Elizabeth, tell us a little bit more about Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. um, because I mean, that is where the term sodomy comes from. So it certainly yeah. would seem to apply. Well, and you experienced it firsthand. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. being told that Sodom and Gomorrah was a reason for me being an abomination, you know? Right. So, so where do people Well, get I that? think that if, well, if they're not familiar with any other anti-gay scripture passage, it's the passage about Sodom and Gomorrah. And so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's very interesting when you delve into what's really going on in that passage and what uh, God condemned about it and what Jesus later condemned about it. And it had absolutely nothing to do with homosexuality. Okay. The story is that two uh, strangers, they, the guys of angels came to Lot's house and said, I need a place to stay. And he said, okay, come on into my home. This was often done back then. It's not like they had a holiday in down the street. So, or a faux share or wherever, you know, they might stay. So they let the, I'm just giving a little advertisement to uh, let people stay in their houses. And so he took them in and, and they were in his home. This entire gang of men comes and starts banging on the door and saying, Give us your guest. We want to know them, which is biblical shorthand for we want to have sex with them. And Lot was infuriated and said, absolutely not. They are guests in my home, not they are men. And this is wrong because you're men and they're men. It's because they were guests in his home. There were two problems with this passage. The first being these men did not want to have some sort of loving homosexual committed relationship with these strangers. They wanted to engage in gang rape. Okay. Wow. So that's number one, that's one cent. 
Okay. Regardless of what sex is we're talking about here, that's one sin. Yeah. The second sin that I find quite fascinating that has never been mentioned very I early, know. I don't know. I do. is that Lot said, but I've got two virgin daughters. I'm glad to give you them. That's what he said. That's the sin. Wow. That is the wow. paternal sin right there. I'll give you my two daughters, but these men are guests in my home. I'm not going to give you them. Why was that considered a sin? Because in first, well, in, in ancient, in the ancient world and in the ancient Near East, not being hospitable was the biggest sin of all. It was a sin of being inhospitable. Now, this sounds crazy to us today. But that's what the sin was, that they wanted to violate the hospitality of Lot. There were, for let me give you an example. When Jesus was born in his hometown, they didn't have monuments erected to war heroes like we do now and like people have been taking down. Oh, no, they had monuments to people who exhibited hospitality. That's who there were monuments to. It was a custom that was expected to be followed. The only time Jesus mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, because they wouldn't, they, they didn't want these men to be welcomed in their home. It was the sin of inhospitality, not yeah. anything related to any sort of sex. And certainly not homosexuality. It, 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 you see how things get lost in translation. Uh -huh. and, and you have you have to wonder as you go through the the Bible. I know there's even a passage. I think it's in Genesis. Uh, I could be wrong, but where they relate homosexuality and refer to male prostitutes. How did that happen? Well, there are a number of uh, passages. There are seven in all of the Bible. Okay, seven there are them. only seven passages that discuss homosexuality. You would think it's half the Bible, the way some people carry on. <laughs> the way people carry on, right. But it's not, okay. Um, and then a number of those, when you look at, first, let me just back up a minute. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language. The New Testament was written in Greek. Every Bible we have in English is a translation, okay? Some translations are better than others. Exactly. Now, the right. worst translation is also the most popular. And that's the King James Version that uses thee and thou and thy and all of that. It's actually the least accurate translation. If you get a good translation that's been done in the last 30 years, you will see different words, first of all, because they were mistranslated before. But also, if you look at the Hebrew in which those passages were written. I'll give you just one quick example. In one of them, there are two different words that in English are translated as man. One means male and one means male prostitute. So the passage is actually talking about sex with temple prostitutes as being wrong. There's never in any of the passages a discussion of committed, loving, homosexual relationships. And in fact, this is one of the most important points of all. The ancient world did not know there was such a thing as sexual orientation. They didn't ah, understand that. They just didn't understand it. So they thought that, you know, that, that there were heterosexual men who also engaged in homosexual acts. They didn't understand it as what we understand it as today. Right. So what you're saying in, in many ways is it was accepted. Well, it well, it wasn't in the Bible, but not because it was gay. OK, it's because they thought it was it sounds strange. OK, but this is what they thought. I mean, they also thought that. Uh, semen held the egg and everything, not the egg, but everything to make a baby, right? The woman was just the receptacle. So they had, they had all kinds of crazy ideas back then, okay? And, and one of them was that if a man, heterosexual man, got tired of sex with his wife or whatever, or whoever it was, then, then they would go and, and, and male a male sex was considered excess. 
was considered not to be in moderation. So what Paul, for instance, in First Romans is saying, don't do anything to excess. He's talking not just about sex. He's talking about don't eat to excess, don't drink to excess, anything. don't have sex to excess. And this is what they thought heterose uh, homosexual acts were. They thought it was an excessive thing on top of, in addition to, if that makes any sense. I hope I it mean, it's crazy. I know it doesn't make sense to us now, but that's what they thought. I mean, no, I mean, and it, you still get a lot of that. I mean, uh, some people don't think sexual orientation is a thing still, that this is a sexual preference. I mean, you do hear that term bandied mm -hmm. about. So, I mean, that is an that is a view that we are still challenging, that this right. is, that is yeah. an orientation and not a preference. So, I mean, for, you know, and hundreds of years ago, not particularly surprising to think that that would have been no. the thinking. And, um, and there never, there are no passages in scripture, none that condemn committed, loving, homosexual relationships. That's um, not what they're talking about. That's not what they're yeah. talking about at all. I mean, I guess, Elizabeth, where my problem comes with some of these passages is, I mean, did God expect us to have an understanding of ancient Hebrew when we read these now? <laughs> you know, because I have to tell you, like, we, I mean, and but you said that the New Testament was in Greek, but when I read that passage in Romans, I don't, it seems pretty clear cut as a reference to engaging in acts with other men and women engaging in acts with other women. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I mean, when I read the plain language of something, it's like I have a hard time thinking, oh, maybe there's something missing. And so how are we supposed to interpret this and be able to read it in a casual manner? You bring up a very good point. And, and clearly there are three passages in the Bible related to homosexual acts that are negative. Three passages, not all of them, but three of them. So what do you do with that? What do you do with the fact that there's a lot of sexist passages in the Bible? Mm, what do you do with the fact that slavery is condoned in both the Old Testament and the New Testament? Mm -hmm. What do you do with that fact? Okay. And this is what you have to do because there are so many places in the Bible where one passage contradicts another passage. That's the problem with people who say they're biblical literalists. Mm -hmm. They're really selective biblical literalists. They're cherry picking. They're pulling out certain passages, not other passages. So what do you do in that when when you, for instance, see this passage in Romans? And yes, it's got some negative things in there, regardless of all the things I just said about they didn't understand sexual orientation. It certainly doesn't come across as positive there. You have to let the Bible critique itself because there's so many contradictory passages in it. Yes. What is the overall message for Christians. The overall message is the message of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. In the final analysis, does this interpretation, does this fit in with Jesus's overall message of loving Every, he didn't qualify that. He didn't say love all your neighbors unless they're gay or lesbian or transgender. He didn't say love all your neighbors unless they're black. Love all your neighbors unless they're disabled. He didn't say any of that. There are no qualifiers. Throughout the Old Testament, God created male and female, male and female, he created them and God saw everything that he had created and indeed it was very good. Nothing is left out. Everything is everything. So when when I read these passages of women keep silent in church or whatever, you know, that's in there, too. Mm -hmm. God, I have to look at it in terms of is that in keeping with the overall message of the Bible? And the answer is no. 
So the other thing is, and I'll say, then I'll be quiet. In, <laughs> that was really fascinating. Yeah. In the Old Testament, okay, if, if you don't, if you're not focused on Jesus, and most of our hearers may not be, then what have you got? Well, what does God do in the Exodus? God sides with the oppressed. Right. God sides with the marginalized against the rulers, against the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. He makes it clear once and for all that he, God makes it clear once and for all that he's on the side of the oppressed and the marginalized. And if any group in America right now is marginalized, it's the LGBTQ community. Yes, ab absolutely. Which brings me to, to my question. How do you take everything you said? And, you know, at Triversity, we had a, a, a spiritual group to because people want to discuss this stuff. How do we open up spirituality to people in the LGBTQ community and bring them back to a faith that, that they want to believe in? Because mm. so many people have been turned away because of what's happened in quote unquote Christianity. We've been very lucky. We've had uh, people on from the Methodist church who, you know, are, are bringing people back in, in the LGBTQ community because of a modern way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So how do, you th how do you think we go about doing this now? Well, if, if people are hungry and they are searching for it, then, then you you use uh, you can use some resources that will highlight these point perspectives that I'm giving you. My book is one of them. There's a wonderful book, just to say. Uh, there's a wonderful book by an evangelical uh, person named Matthew Vine, uh, who is gay, and it's called God and the Gay Christian. And it just blew up the evangelical world a while back. He did tremendous amount of research. He looks at all these passages and says some of the things that I have said tonight. And you, you study it. You study the scripture. The easy part is to look at passages that are also in my book like this, um, where God said, you are precious in my sight in the book of Isaiah. That's the universal you. You are precious in right. my sight. And some of us, and I think women, I think the LGBTQ, um, people of color, um, all, you know, all disenfranchised groups need to relearn what our society has told them because we live in a patriarchal, white, heterosexual world. And that, you know, anything other than that is somehow viewed as an aberration. Um, I was doing some extra reading to get ready for tonight and ran across where Aristotle said that women were just deformed men, that we were deformed. You know, that's why we don't have the same parts. So, oh, my you know, Lord. I mean, this has been going on forever and, and we, we have to educate ourselves. Oh, heaven help me. So um, <laughs> with along those lines, and I, I'm not coming from a religious background, you, you know that I was kind of raised with everything, but I often think about how the Bible treats transitioning. Is there any mention of it at all? Because surely there had to be people back then that, you know, identified with one gender or another, but biologically they were one gender or another. How, how does the Bible deal with that? Um, well, I don't think it's kind of like they didn't know any understand in the ancient world. Uh, they didn't understand sexual orientation. Uh, they did understand, for instance, there were some women like Deborah who uh, were in male roles. She was a judge and she helped a general lead 10,000 troops in battle. Now, that's not a typical women's role uh, at all in her time. Uh, there were, if you read about Jacob and Esau, they were twins. Okay. Esau yeah. is the kind of rough, burly one. And Jacob is described as being soft and being in the tent. That's where the women were. And so there were always, you know, human nature is human nature, but they didn't, there's nothing that I have found specifically referenced at all. Right? No, but, but again, it goes back to the same passages of God created male and female and God saw everything that God had created and it was very good. So there are no exceptions. God's not saying, you know, it, it, that everything except somebody who wants to transition. 
that's not in there. You know, so you have to, I think, take take it that way. You are precious in my sight. And and so is somebody who's transitioning, precious in God's sight. And um, yet, you know, they're 10 times more likely to attempt suicide than somebody who doesn't transition. Um, gays and lesbians are three and a half times more likely to attempt suicide. That was actually my entry point into this. I had a suicide in my family. And, and that's where I, I said, okay, I, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to speak out um, because I know that pain. I know that pain. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's a sin. The, the way the Bible has been weaponized. Weaponized. Great, great way. Scripture of has been weaponized with the fake news that woman was created its second and sinned first and therefore inferior, that homosexuals and lesbians don't have a place in the kingdom of God and are sinful, the fake news that slaves should submit to their masters because there are other passages that say they shouldn't. You know, the, this, the Bible has been abused to set up this hierarchy that has hurt everybody in the long run. Well put. Yeah, absolutely. So, Elizabeth, um, as we're on the subject, we have a question, and this is from Simone. Though she did it kind of under the Triversity um, banner, because none of us know how to switch between our personal names and Triversity. But one of the questions she asked is about Deuteronomy twenty-two five, which unfortunately I only have in King James. But it says, "The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man." neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abominations unto the Lord. And it seems like that may be the one <laughs> verse that we have. <laughs> That's very interesting. I, you know, I'm not familiar with that. Well, let me, let me just say this. There are so many things in Deuteronomy that are, are an abomination. Okay. Eating shellfish is an abomination. Eating um, a cloven hoofed animal is an abomination. So you can't, some people will, like I say, pick that out and say, well, we don't have to pay attention to the rest of it, but I'm going to make a big deal about this one. No, you, you, you can't do that. that. You can't do it that way. Mm -hmm. So you, again, you've got to look at the overall message of scripture, which says that we're all created in God's image. That's the overarching message of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which Deuteronomy is in, um, is, is that we're all created in the image of God. And that includes a man who wants to dress as a woman or a woman wants to dress as a man. You know, it, it, there's no exceptions to that. No, no exceptions. We have a, a good comment question from Will Vocal. Aren't a lot of these Bible stories just that? Stories written by men at a point in time with their viewpoints and mores, nothing more, nothing less. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, it's true about some of them. For instance, um, there's a difference between Bible stories, which is what he was discussing. So let me discuss what he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, was there a Noah's Ark? Probably not. Oh, I want that to be. That's my favorite story. Sorry about that. That Did has to be a pretty big bug. inside the ark. No. Um, was Eve created out of the rib of Adam? Probably not. You know, but you have to know there are two different creation accounts in the book of Genesis. Okay. The first is the one that I've been quoting. The second is the one about Adam and Eve. So, yes, there are some stories that are more myth uh, because and, and are they just made up? No, they're not just made up. They are very serious stories that they the ancient people use to make sense out of things that didn't make any sense to them. It's the way they explained things like this is how we came to be. This is why there's pain in the world. There was an um, Adam and an Eve and they ate of this fruit. And so now we've got, she's got pain in childbearing. That's how they explained it. So yes, it's a story in one sense, but it's true in another. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but is all of the Bible 
just made up? No, no. But are there some stories in the Bible? Yes. So um, before we move on, um, we have an interesting point um, from our guest last week, Francis Cisco, who yes. um, is discussing this Deuteronomy verse. And she said, in Deuteronomy, I think the issue was about deception being an abomination, not necessarily the cross-dressing aspect of the verse being an abomination. That, that's okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. I really am not familiar with that passage, so I hesitate to, to say too much about it. I, but now I'm going to look it up. Thank yeah, but, you. Yeah, when you think about it, right, it, it is a deception, you know. Yeah, well, yeah. well <laughs> but but it in could those, be seen as what, it's an, I guess. but again, it's an interpretation. Yeah, That's absolutely. what I'm getting from a lot of what we're talking about today: it, interpretation and um, taking those interpretations. I like bring it back now to to modern times because more than ever in the LGBTQ community and in the world, people are seeking spirituality. I mean, prior to this pandemic, mm. they were seeking it. Now, more than ever, this has been a big game changer. It was a wake up call for mm. a lot of people. So Elizabeth, how do we take all of this going forward? You know, these Bible interpretations, what, what do we believe? What do we not believe? How do we apply all of this to our own life and our own spiritual beliefs? Order this book. <laughs> I love you to death. You good for you. I was hoping I was going to ask you if you had it there, if you could hold it up. Uh, yeah, I've got little things in case I needed to refer to it. But this is why I wrote it. Okay, and and I wrote it. There's also a chapter on survival, and I wrote it before COVID. But it's how. But it was really at the time I wrote it was how do we survive with all this fake news that's around? How do we survive when we can't take one more second of conventions that are going on or not, you know, how do we survive? And it's, it's all in here because, and, and the book is 101 biblical reflections. It's meant to be savored slowly, one at a time, one day at a time to just, you know, so go to the survival chapter first. And in there I've got, you know, where God says, um, when you pass through fire, I will be with you. When the, Floods are about to overwhelm you. I will be with you. And, and these are the passages that we need to not only read, but, but take into our hearts right now. Right, take you know, when, when you're sitting in your house quarantining and you don't know if your child is sick, I am with you, you know? Um, and, and these are times when we really need something to hang on to. Um, but right. also in here, there's a chapter on each ism the reason is there has, I don't have to tell you all, there is a, has been a terrible resurgence of all the isms in the last, shall we say, four years. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so we've got to tackle that head on too. And, and it talks about how can we look at this uh, with what's going on in our world today, with the reality of the world that we're living in, how, is it relevant anymore? Is, is, is the church relevant? Is faith relevant? I think it is. Oh my gosh. I would think now more than, more than ever, you know, we're all looking, we, we, we need it. You just said it. It's, it's survival. Yeah. We need faith, right. but we also need to be able to combat people that try to weaponize a holy book, you know? So, I mean, and this is what your book helps people to do. I mean, to be able well, to. I hope so. And I have said to people in the very beginning, look, if you read some fake news that tells you or that tells you that your neighbor is less than, is not equal to, counter it with some of the true news in this book. And you've got my permission. Just quote it. <laughs> I don't care. I just throw it out there. So Elizabeth, um, how do people get your yeah. book? Um, and how do they find out more information about you as well? And can we put it in the back? Can we put the website and everything? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a website, elizabethgeitz.com. It's pretty easy. If you see my name up there, it's just plain old elizabethgeitz.com. And there are three different ways to order the book. Uh, you can order it through an indie uh, bookstore. You can order it through the publisher, Wiffenstock, which is out in Oregon, or a more than that, Amazon. Barnes and Noble. It's okay. All great. Yeah. Just okay. type in the title. 
And you know what? We will type. Yeah, we're going to do that right now. He does the typing. <laughs> yeah, don't don't write what Wendy said. <laughs> I've seen the wrong book. <laughs> that may be a book, but it's not. Yeah, it was a book in Wendy's head, but maybe <laughs> that's your book. <laughs> oh my lord! What are kinds of things that you're going to be doing going forward to address fake news and spirituality? I'm doing things like this, um, uh, doing some classes, doing some speaking, doing some preaching. Um, you know, uh, some of these things that are in the book, uh, whether it's women's issues or LGBTQ issues, have been talked about in small groups, but not so much from the pulpit necessarily. And I'm tackling it in the pulpit. Yeah, and when I did good. that the first time, um, it, it was on sexism because I figured, well, that's 50 percent of the population. Let me start with that one. Some women came up to me afterwards were crying and hugging me, oh. you know, and and um, and I think we need to hear the true news that that we are all loved by God. Lo God loves us with a love that knows no bounds. And and that's the true news. That's the true news that we need to hear. And the news that, you know, you mentioned right. what comes from the, the fake news, as we're calling it, you know, that you're an abomination and stuff that, that leads to depression and suicides and all of that. Yeah. But hearing the good news, the true news, what that can do for so many right. people. How wonderful it would have been, you know, if even if I got came at with Sodom and Gomorrah to be able to say, well, you know, actually, <laughs> uh, I can refer you to um, spiritual truth in the, in the age of fake news, yeah. and you will yeah. see that this was more for hospitality and the strength that can come for that and the affirmation that comes from having a better understanding. Uh, it's a better understanding. Passages. Well, yeah. we need to re-educate ourselves because so often we've bought into that fake news. And the fact that that the Bible has been used to perpetuate it and abused is just very, very trouble. And it's nothing short of a sin in my book. That's what it is. It is nothing short of a sin. You're you're absolutely right. In terms of educating, are there uh, universities that are teaching from what you've written in this book? No, but wouldn't that be nice? I mean, yeah, that's where I'm, that's, I have to tell you, that's where I'm going with it because I. Yeah. I believe like everyone who tuned in tonight and this will be on on youtube people can go in and see it there you have gotten out an incredibly important message and all of us right now are are being we're being asked by the universe by god get a message out okay it's time for all of us to love each other love equally mm -hmm. and a book like this really should be taught in in universities all right because well, it's very I hope that a lot of, well, I hope that in a lot of universities, uh, and I'd be surprised if there weren't un, a lot uh, understanding of the things that I'm talking about, but it just depends. I mean, it, I, I don't know. It certainly depends on the school. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering wow. if like in the South where you are. Well, I'm wondering if right. Jerry Falwell Jr. on his boat <laughs> right. was talking about spiritual truth. And well, <laughs> I, he was, he was doing something on that boat. I don't think coffee right, well. is show but yeah <laughs> that's a crazy you know i well don't even go there <laughs> yeah that's a whole that, that's a whole, a whole other, other can of worms <laughs> but yeah if we if we can 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 get this message that's and i want to give a shout out to, today to two wow. people amy ferris and suzanne levine are the two that are here in milford that urged me to write this book they said you've got to do this I, oh i've got i'm busy i don't know no, Elizabeth, especially before this election, you got to get this book out there. And I really give both of them a lot of credit in, in pushing me to write this. And that's another thing we can do is we can um, push, you know, we can advocate uh, our friends using the gifts that we know they have exactly. to get out there and use them and do something with them. Um, so, yeah. Your timing couldn't have been better. So, and I know both Amy and Suzanne so fantastic that they were the wind beneath your wings to do this. They, they were. were. They pushed me. 
they put me here, I would have been saying, no, no, I'm busy. No, no. They kept, when are you going to do this, Elizabeth? And well, then I waited till the last minute and wrote like crazy. This time last year, all I was doing was writing the book all day. But I, it, it, you know, you just have to do it. We, we all, mm. all need to say, what is it I'm supposed to do? What gift am I supposed to use to do something in this time when the isms are all experiencing a resurgence mm -hmm. and so many people are getting hurt? Sometimes it's making a joyful noise into the Lord. And mm -hmm. I think that's what you're doing. Absolutely. You know, like you're raising your voice. And thank uh, you. And I, I mean, I speak as one gay person to say your book is wonderful. And I'm so touched that there are people like you who are willing to write these things. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a comment from Simone Krauss, if you'll address this. The Catholic Church in June of 2019, when they released this statement, a transgender identity, the document asserts, seeks to annihilate the concept of nature. What are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, I'm not Catholic. Um, uh, there's a lot in the Catholic church and in um, other traditional religions about what's natural and what's not natural. And um, like I just told you, of course, this was Aristotle, but women were viewed as not natural. So, you know, that, that it, it's certainly anything other than a white straight male um, for dec centuries has been somewhat not natural. So, you know, I, yeah, it, one of the original, um, what, what they were saying about homosexuality not being natural in the Bible, what they meant was that, that, that um, if a man acts like a woman, it degrades all men. God forbid anybody should be a woman. So this thing about natural and unnatural, it, it, uh, uh, Phyllis Shafley used to say, uh, who was, of course, the big no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> was that it's not the natural order for women to be leaders. It's not the natural order for women to pr be priests like I am. So, yeah, you know, what do I think about that? I don't think much of it because a lot of people think I'm not natural because I'm a priest. So. I mean, in the irony of Phyllis Shafley is that she led the effort to invalidate the inner or the Equal Rights Amendment. So, I mean, it's like she stood against the very thing that she was exactly. saying. Right. Well, no, no, she didn't. She said it's unnatural for women to be equal to men because they're not. The natural order is that women are here and men are here. That's what she was saying. She agreed with that, which is crazy. So, yeah, I mean, I... I I know I'm sh can imagine that that's very, very hurtful for a transgendered person to read. Um, I believe like these other uh, things that have come out on the other side in a, a more inclusive place. I believe that will too at some point in time, but keep in mind the Catholic church uh, still does not ordain women or um, homosexuals or, you know, so it, it may be, Certainly not in my lifetime is any of that going to happen, I don't think. This has been quite the conversation Absolutely. tonight. <laughs> I can't, we can't thank you enough. Can you hold up your book one more time and tell of people where they can get it? Of okay. course. That's it. Um, uh, and so it's um, just go to Amazon.com. That's the quickest. Oh, way. It's as easy as spiritual truth in the age of fake news. See, I got it right finally. And you got it. You and got I, it. Thank you. And I'll make sure on Triversity's end, we're going to announce this maybe in the next week or so, but we are going to open a lending library and we will make sure that spiritual truth in the age of fake news is in that library, as well as God and the gay Christian, which um, I didn't realize when we were talking today, I actually already bought for the living library. Well, what do you know? That, that's, great. That's, great. Uh, that's great. Uh, there's another good book by Walter Wink uh, about uh, homosexuality in the Bible. There's a number of, of good books, more than you might think. So uh, we need to just educate ourselves. And, and, you know, if, if, if people don't get anything out of this broadcast, other than, than one thing I would be so happy, which is God loves you. 
God loves you just as you are and just as God created you to be. And, and you're not meant to be anything other than that. And, and, and the, the challenge sometimes for some of us is to love ourselves and accept ourselves mm -hmm. because we're given messages all day long in subtle and not so subtle ways that we're not okay. And, and just this, at, at times in my life, my mantra has sort of been, you are precious in my sight. You are precious in my sight. And I just keep saying that to myself. You are precious in my sight. God is saying this to me. And, um, you know, sometimes you can know it, but you might not feel it. And, and um, that's the tragedy of what, what, how scripture has been abused. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who, who tuned in tonight. Uh, we love having you. Absolutely. We love sharing okay. all of this with everyone tonight. And Elizabeth, you are, you're such a rock star. Thank you for being oh, here. Oh, you all are. And if you haven't seen Wendy's cooking show, it's the funniest thing oh, on the internet. God. <laughs> you had to go there i'm glad i'm glad that you watch it though yeah and i do that show because that is my way of raising people up and making them feel good mm -hmm. it's not like cooking it's just making people feel loved and i believe entertained it's not your cooking yeah <laughs> and it's certainly not my cooking but um you know what we're entertaining all you know what entertaining and we can all raise each other up and i think now more than ever right Absolutely. in this age of fake news that's yes big yes and uh, so keep that in mind and spread that, learn the true news and spread it and just keep telling yourself that you are made in the image of God, period. And nothing anybody says is going to can ever change that. That's just the way it is. And can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. So much, <laughs> Elizabeth. Um, and thank you everyone for watching again. If you're on our YouTube channel, give us a like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. If you're on Facebook, throw us a like or even a heart. Hearts are especially good. Um, so, we love, we love hearts. Yes. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. And good night. Good night. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.